Migration and immigration allows for the free flow of ideas above all else. And it also allows for more tolerant and open societies. What happened with Brexit? It instilled a lot of passion in the people that felt that only British people belong in Britain. I'm going to use my money for my welfare inside of my box that is my country. And instead of helping the neighbour that is suffering and having so much problem with everything, they just want their money for their people. We're very lucky in a way to be able to choose and handpick our new immigrants and our new Canadians from a vast pool of people worldwide. But when you look at it, not every other country has that same privilege as we do. And is that right for us to be taking that approach to immigration? Someone who's running away from, from fear, they will not be stopped by walls or borders. And that's where we do everything wrong. Migration has made us who we are as societies. How can we now be questioning that? Hello, friends, and welcome to Six Degrees St. Gallen. Je tiens à remercier la très honorable Adrian Clarkson, John Walton Saul, et tous les organisateurs qui ont rendu cette incroyable conférence possible. Vous savez, j'ai eu la chance de prendre la parole dans le cadre de cette conférence l'année dernière à Toronto, et c'est vraiment un honneur pour moi de partager quelques mots avec vous à nouveau cette année. I know the conversations you're having here today are deeply powerful and important, and it's an honor to get to share a few words with you again this year. At Six Degrees Toronto last year, I spoke about fear of the other. If we live in fear, we can't be creative. And if we can't be creative, we can't contribute to human progress. In St. Gallen, I challenge you to be creative and open to one another. Creativity comes out of diversity. And as the Institute for Kenyan Citizenship says, diversity is a reality. Inclusion is a choice. So how each of us accepts the diversity around us and whether we choose to be inclusive is at the heart of any Six Degrees discussions. And I wish you a provocative and productive one right here in St. Gallen. We all know the saying, truth or consequences. The most difficult conversations we will ever face will be the ones about our own inner truths as individuals. If we're allowed to express how we feel and what we think from the get-go in a free and democratic society, we allow ourselves to be creative because we don't live out of fear. Not just in Canada, but around the world. Our differences are what makes us stronger. But what are we taught to believe? Because diversity means creativity and innovation. And that's how we grow our economies and it's how we move forward together. And events like this one are so important because when we come together and learn from each other, that's how we start to build true inclusion, justice and equality in this world. And as Six Degrees reminds us, there is so much that connects us. And to see ourselves in each other, all we have to do is look. Everyone here understands that. So thank you because you're a voice for progress and for empathy. And you are in many ways helping to heal our world. Je vous souhaite une magnifique conférence du fond du cœur. Thank you. From my heart to yours. Merci. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm delighted to be here today with Tyler Brule. Um, we both uh, grew up in Ottawa, and we went to high school there, and that's something that we share. Uh, a little different time, a little different area of the city, but uh, we're very proud of him as a Canadian who has made his mark as a world citizen and who uh, leaves his mark, quite frankly. He's a brand, and he makes brands, and he knows how to do identity and identify things. And I think that's really what we're talking about when we talk about citizenship as well. When we talk about citizenship, we're really talking about what are we uh, as people? What are we, how do we identify ourselves? How do I, we identify ourselves with others? Uh, are we part of a group? Uh, could we, can you be a citizen in isolation? Uh, can, have you, do you have to have a country? Can you be a citizen without a country? Uh, if you are part of a country, how do you, what, what are the things that anchor you 
to those uh, to those things. And I just want to point out before I forget, at any time, that this book written by uh, uh, Tyler and his group, How to Make a Nation, is a terrific and good read for all for everybody. I think because it talks about all the things that bring us together, and that is really what citizenship is about. Because you can't, I don't believe, become a citizen. A really functioning citizen without a group of people. Um, I think when you when you think of uh, a country, you think of a place that is really a place that people belong in, and that not only do they belong in it, but they feel that they belong. If they don't feel that they belong, then it isn't a country. If if it's a set of values that holds people together, uh, if it's a set of values placed in a territory then you have a country, but you have the values that, that citizenship was able to bring to that. And I think that's one of, the, one of the interesting things. We've had different experiences, you and I, Tyler, of, of that. My life was led uh, very much in the world of television, and he, was, he started out as a journalist too at the BBC and, and, uh, and then moved on from there. And I spent a lot of years at the CBC, I called it my mother house really, and then branched out into uh, doing public service and, um, and eventually became governor general. And I think that the experiences that you bring, if you don't come from regular roots of feeding into things, you don't go to a specific school because you're going to take a role in administration as we see so often in Europe. Uh, if you come from the outside, both of us are outsiders. Uh, both of us have come from the outside to the inside. And I think that's very interesting because a lot of people who become citizens today are not the people who are in the country already. They're the people who've come. They're the people who have to be there and they've got to get taken in. And Canada is an example of that. Canada is a country which is home to people from all over the place, but started out with a fundamental triangular foundation uh, which John Ralston Saul talks about frequently, which is the Aboriginal people who were there before anybody else, then came the French, and then came the others. And we are built on that scale in a relatively inhospitable climate over the second greatest landmass in the world. And I do want to head off at the pass any discussion that we might have that of course we can have immigration and we can take all these people because we're such a big country. So much of us is not <laughs> inhabitable and we don't spread people out on one acre parcels. Uh, they do come to cities, they congregate in towns. Uh, and so that's not what makes us what we are. What makes us what we are to you? And you've lived, you're living your life in, you know, in, in Britain, where, from which you've written a column, from which you do your branding thing. Now you've, you're opening your office in Zurich in, in 10 days. Um, you do work all over the world. What is it? What makes it? I think it's, it's a variety of things, um, Adrian, and, and thank you very much um, for inviting me here with your colleagues as well. Um, I grew up um, in Winnipeg, um, and this is, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, it's almost the geographic center of, of North America. Um, and it is very flat, and it is properly inhospitable for most of the year. Um, but it was, you know, if you if you look at that city, it was it was in a way the the last station, uh, or also the beginning station of people forging their way further west in Canada. Um, an incredible um, melting pot. I mean, as a child of the late 60s, early 70s, um, you know, very much obviously defined by its native Canadian community, a very strong French community, and then also a very strong community from Eastern Europe as well. So I think that you know, where I've ended up, I think I've been informed by you know, pinballing through, um, I think, so many cities in Canada, Ottawa as well, Montreal, Toronto, Kitchener. Um, and in all of those places, though, you were immersed in a different community. So I can speak of the one, you know, the community obviously that was that was Winnipeg. Um, I remember then you know, arriving in Kitchener, which you know has the second biggest Oktoberfest outside of Germany. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's it's quite bizarre uh, that you can be in this uh, little stretch of Canada and and lots of people have proper tracht. There's proper lederhosen and dirndls um, in uh, you know in, in many people's wardrobes. 
And, and you know, and, and that was an interesting, you know, immersion as well, being amongst, uh, you know, third, second generation German families who come to Canada. And then there's the Montreal experience, which is, uh, you know, one of, yeah, you know, I was living off the West Island um, in a proper resistant enclave uh, that was very vocal um, about, yeah, a, 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 let's say a unilateral approach to language, uh, that being French. Um, so I think all of those things um, have, have, I think, really informed where I am today. And you always have to look back and you sort of wonder why, you know, why did I end up um, in Sweden once upon a time? Why did I, why did I end up buying uh, a bit of bald rock in the middle of the Baltic? Well, it was my childhood in Ottawa um, in many ways. It was very familiar. Um, my, uh, my, my mother's side of the family is Estonian. So all of the Estonians who came to, uh, to Ottawa they wanted to set up their own little version of the Baltic world up on the Ottawa River. Um, and so you realize then later in life that you know, all of these experiences and all of these experiences because of Canada's rich tapestry and diversity um, yeah, inform you know, where you are. I'm still trying to wonder, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out Zurich, but anyway, we'll come back to that. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because I'm a little earlier than you. I came as a refugee uh, at the age of three with my family. We having lost everything to the Japanese in Hong Kong. We were flotsam and jetsam of the world, and we got on a boat, and the Red Cross delivered us, and we went to Canada, and we had nothing. We had had a lot, okay? And when you have had a lot, and it have it all taken away from you, you have a couple of different reactions, I think. In, my ca in our case, in our family, it was always just understood that we would get everything back. Uh, there was no question we would get everything back. And we came and settled in a town called Ottawa, which happened to be the capital city, but was a very small town of about, small city of 90,000 people, and, uh, and which was white, white with snow, white breaded, white people. And um, very divided in terms linguistically and religiously. The Irish Catholics did not, did not deal well with French Canadian Catholics. They went to separate schools, they went to separate parishes, they killed each other on the football field, and, um, and it was very unattractive uh, in, in so many ways. And yet, it was interesting because it gave me the start in Canada of knowing what that kind of society could bring. And out of that, from the 40s on, we developed so quickly into a country which was that understood that we, it was a value to have English and French, and we became officially bilingual when I was relatively young. Uh, we had not been that, uh, made that officially bilingual, so that now when you are in Vancouver, you see bilingual signs, you get uh, CBC television all across the country in both French and English. You have all of these kinds of things happening, and what happened after the war, which I remembered very distinctly, because little kids came into my classes who didn't speak any English, but who came from, who were called DPs, displaced people, and they came from all over Europe and they had no citizenship, and Canada took them in. And so my background was no, having been dispossessed, welcoming more dispossessed people, and growing up with people who were dispossessed, or who had made a choice, very courageous, many of them, to voluntarily immigrate from places like Italy, Holland, particularly Italy, etc., in order to better their lives. And uh, they did in Canada. And so that was what I grew up with, this idea that we would get somehow better and better and the country would use us in a better and better way. Did you have that feeling that, that it, was, it was getting to be a better and better place all the time? It was. I, you know, I grew up first generation, or at least on my mother's side, you know, my mother's you know, nickname was, was DP. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, they, left, they left Estonia um, in, uh, yeah, and obviously in, in the 40s. Um, after the war, the family found themselves uh, in, in Germany and eventually uh, made their way up north to Lübeck and, and arrived in Canada in 1950 um, and in Ottawa and settled, you know, not far off of Island Park Drive. Um, so, you know, a nice stretch of, um, of the city. But again, arrived with nothing and with always that notion exactly to think that they would one day go back to Estonia. Um, and um, 
but I can say I'm actually heading to Ottawa in a few weeks. My grandmother's turning 100, um, and uh, and is yeah is 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 still there in, in in the same house that they built when they when they got there. Um, and it but it's interesting. There is that she has been lobbying to say she'd like her birthday in Estonia um, still, and uh, and she is completely fit to fly, which is amazing. Um, uh, so there's 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 some good genes in the family, but it it is interesting that that was. You know, the family coming to Canada and uh, with nothing, this notion that yes, maybe one day they would go home, but people had to forge their own way. And also, I think the idea that in Canada you could do what you, what you wanted and become what you wanted to be uh, in a different way. And I always say that I think that coming to a new country, no matter what circumstances, whether you chose it because you thought it would be a better life, whether you were thrown there like the flotsam and jetsam of the world, uh, which we continue to do, we take refugees in, it is a matter of, uh, of, of the fact that we basically know that we, can, that, that we can become transformed, and that is a very important word. Citizenship is one thing, because citizenship implies that you are one of a group of people. You cannot become an isolated citizen. You cannot be, exercise citizenship as an isolated person. You have to have a society in which to do that. And so that is what I think gives us it gives us that strength because in Canada we have always had a conscious immigration policy and a conscious sense. Uh, we have a Ministry of Immigration and, and Citizenship. It's now styled Immigration Refugees and Citizenship because we, you know, that is that is the thing that we are going to deal with in the in the present and in the in the in the, in the very in the future to come. Uh, because of the movement of population, so we're going to be all pressed to take more, and that is really that is that is something that is important, and it throws us back on the fact that, you know, you from Estonia. I always I had Estonian friends as a child, and they all grew up had a tremendous sense of loss because they only had this brief shining moment when they had their own country, with before they were trammeled here and there, etc. And so I think that creates something in people. Uh, not just loss, but this idea that you didn't quite succeed to do it there. And so maybe you can succeed in where you've found it. And that's where you found yourself and found your feet. And I think democracy uh, calls out to people like that who have lost things because democracy makes you feel that in the real democracy means that you have the freedom to speak and to act. And I think that's the appeal of countries that have demonstrated their, de their democratic ideals to people. And it should be the strength of the people who are there, who are taking in the new people, that they feel that their democracy can absorb that. And it's interesting, because th no matter what terrible shape democracy is in, we still cling to it, you know, like bits of, uh, of well-constructed uh, shipwreck. Um, no matter what goes wrong with it, we think, grab that mast of, you know, the ability to speak out freely or, or, or that prow because it leads us to be able to think of voting, etc. And that, that, that ideal of democracy is something that, that we need always to promote to ourselves and, and, to, and to, uh, to the feeling of people who come to us so that they feel that they are coming to something that is that is free, that they feel that is free and organized and, and where they will have a voice. Because, you know, actually the speaking out of democracy as it was known to the Greeks was, that was what democracy was in the Agora. You could speak out and other people could shout you down and you could speak out. Now I know all the problems about Greek democracy. You don't have to go into them, you know, women and they had, women were not citizens, slaves were not citizens, if you were not born in Athens, you were not a citizen. But take that little tiny shining ideal that we built on and say, you know, how, where are we now? And I think we have done some of that, even with our own private dreams. Uh, it would be interesting, for, from your perspective, Adrian, for, for people who aren't familiar with the, the, the Canadian construct and where it is today, what are the forces? What happens? You know, you arrive from Eritrea, uh, or you come from Laos, wherever you come from in the world. Um, what happens in Canada that you think is different to, and we don't have to just refer to what happens south of the border, uh, but versus arriving in the UK or even Australia? Well, what I think happens is that Canada 
was always a poor country. And we didn't have rich English gentlemen with plantations and slaves um, who then had a little civil war between themselves and created the American nation. What we had was uh, a very interesting land with many, many different tribes in it and up north uh, a, different, a different set of people, the Inuit, but south was the First Nations people, the indigenous people. And they were the people who were able to welcome us and show us the way into wealth, the way into an economy which was all built on the beaver pelt and all possible only through going by canoe. And how did you learn to make a canoe and use a canoe and have canoes that held 40 people and tons of beaver pelts? You learned that from the native people who took you in. And that's why we were taken in by the native people and that has been imprinted in us, in our DNA. Even when you come here, you learn the history of Canada and you realize that a horse wouldn't have helped you to develop in Canada. There were no roads. We, even in the 19, late, it, you know, till about 1850, most of the, it was only waterways. Waterways, the Great Lakes led to people along, uh, settling along the lakes. Rivers took you into the wilderness, the discovery. And I think that has made a profoundly different country. And our economy, therefore, was done out of resources, for better or for worse. That's where we found that we were resource-based, as opposed to an American economy, which had a climate which allowed them to build, to, to grow cotton, and to base their economy entirely on slave labor. And, of course, much encouraged by the Europeans, particularly the French and the British, in ports like Nantes and Bristol, which were huge slave uh, ports, which they're only coming to recognize now. And I think um, that difference of our country is something that we as Canadians have found it hard to accept. Mm. You know, we'd like to think of ourselves, and we're such a myth-making machine in the United States. No wonder they have Hollywood and they create dreams. They're fantasy land. Um, they're, they're a theme park. And, um, and there's a series of theme parks that they just got a latest new one in Tennessee, which I'm dying to go and see on, about, about how the world was created. It's creationist theme park. It'll be very interesting combining that summer trip. holiday sorted. Yeah, you try combining that trip with Graceland and going to the Grand Old Opry in Tennessee would be a you know is a good triangle I think. Um, but in Canada we never we didn't have that. We there our climate our geography does not leave any time any place for illusion. You know illusion is not what Canada is about. We don't have that kind of thing. We had to work very hard, and then when we decided, and it was a conscious policy on the part of the government at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, as you know, uh, to welcome people um, from the interior of Europe, Hungarians, Ukrainians, Russians, Poles, to open up uh, agriculturally the prairies that were beyond those rivers and beyond that initial stick. And so we had a conscious policy of immigration. People often say, well, it's such a big country, you can have so many, et cetera. But you have to develop it properly, and I, we think we had, we had that. We had very sensible people who said, you come, we'll give you a cow and a plow and you know, five bags of seed and uh, 300 hectares of land. Mm -hmm. I mean, 640 acres is about 300 hectares of land. And you'll build a house and you'll, you know, you'll live there and we will see how that goes. And so with that, we developed you know, agriculture, not just from Europe. We developed our own seeds. We developed a, a wheat called the Marquis wheat, which made it possible for us to live in such a cold climate, to also get two crops out of, out of places in northern Alberta, like, like the Peace River District. Um, we, we used that technology in order to make our land habitable. So a lot of effort went into it, but we never told anybody basically about it, except when we said, well, we maybe need some more people to open up this land. Now they can come. We've got these, these seeds. I don't know. What do you think in that? No, I think on, yeah, there's, there's something that happened, I think, within, so I look back to education, what happened in schools. And yeah. it was, um, you know, there was always, and this is obviously the 1970s, so you know, there was always people, they were fleeing, obviously, uh, from the other side of the Iron Curtain. So every September, there was, there was a, new fe you know, a new group of kids who were from Romania, um, from, uh, of course, the former Yugoslavia, um, 
you know, people who had, had managed to, to flee the, the Baltic states at that point. And, and that was always sort of you know, part of what happened every September. Yeah, and the kids who couldn't speak English, the kids who could not speak English, and in three months they could speak English. And then, you know, this has happened in waves in, in Canada. I was talking to a group of young people the other day who said that one of the highlights of their life was they were in grade 10 when we took 70,000 Vietnamese boat people. And uh, we had never had Vietnamese, very, we had a lot of, uh, when I first came to the country, there was a, a residue of Chinese people who had be, been brought practically as slaves to build the railway. And then because Canada was quite a racist country, and stayed that way uh, semi-officially until about 1960, uh, said to these people, you know, we're going to drop you off on little places on the railway line. And there, the, the poor little men didn't know what to do, so they started what's called Chinese-Canadian restaurants and opened laundries. And that was the Chinese uh, population when my family came there. Nobody had ever heard of Hong Kong. Nobody knew that there was a place like that. Um, it was completely, it was a completely different kind of thing. And then I remember DPs coming and kids not speaking English, and then in three months they did, and they're bringing their parents to a parent teacher's day. The parents didn't speak English. And by the next year, you know, little Inga from Denmark, uh, they'd come and her mother and father spoke English the next year. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's been the history of it. And I started with these kids who were at high school, and what they did in certain high schools was, as their volunteer activity, they asked the kids to stay, three or four of them, to stay after school for one hour mm -hmm. and just talk to Vietnamese kids just to have conversation so that they would improve their language skills because they can't do it just in school. So that became quite, quite you know, uh, widespread in different schools. And Canadians like to volunteer. We're the most volunteering country in the world. I think at any given time, 35% Canadians volunteer. And, um, and like to, and in our high schools now in Ontario, you can't graduate from high school without having done a certain number of volunteer hours. Just because you know, you're in the habit of it and, they, and they, people like it. Our form of national service. It's our form of national service. I wish in a way we could institute a little, a little more of it because I think we, we know in a country with that kind of cold, that at some point you might be in a snowstorm and you would have to trudge to somebody's door and they would have to take you in because they recognize that they could be in the same boat. So we are at the extremes of knowing what it is to, to say home. And it isn't Heimat, you no. know, it's no, no. not Heimat. And I know what Heimat is because I watched the television series years ago. <laughs> um, and also because I discussed this word with various people over the years. And it's not, it's not homeland. Um, it, if we have anything that we could call our home or center, it's values. It's this, it's this feeling that we, we share a common um, ethos of the fact that we know that you have to reach out to other people because you can't make it any other way. And, and I think culture, which you're so interested in, comes into that yeah. very strongly. By the way, you talk about commonality. I think one of the, the most extraordinary things, it was, and it really stood out to me um, as I think one of the most interesting economic, cultural, political moves, um, when you did your transpolar uh, trip all of those years ago. And for those who aren't familiar, um, uh, Madam Clarkson had this idea that, that, uh, that we had a, a shared set of values, uh, not just with the, the big country to the south, um, but there was a, an, a, a really an environmental imperative uh, that needed to be addressed. But also, um, when you look east and west from Canada, um, that maybe there was something that we shared in common um, with Greenlanders um, and, and of course, with Danes and Norwegians uh, and everyone who Swedes. shares and Swedes and everyone who shares the top of the world. Yeah. Um, and it's it, to me that was one of the most amazing things that, as a moment in time, that we we addressed and and, and you led that. Um, and and I think it was only sort of late that people sort of started to recognize that in our own country that actually. Maybe we, you know, listen, of course, well, I'm not sure how our diplomatic ties are with Washington, depending on the day of the week right now. But, um, but certainly, should, we, should Ottawa be having more of a dialogue with Oslo and with Stockholm and with Copenhagen and Helsinki and, and, and go the other direction to Tokyo and Beijing as well? 
Well, I think that, you know, that is certainly one of the things that we very much pushed when we, uh, when I was Governor General, because the circumpolar nations are the most important uh, for us in many ways. We, we inhabit the top of the world, and we discovered that we were the only country that did not have a northern university, that everybody has a northern university except us, and we think, you know, we're still fighting to convince people of that because our northern studies happen in southern universities because they want the funding. They want to keep the funding there, okay? They want to have their Arctic Institute at Laval University in Quebec City or at the University of Calgary in the southern part of Alberta. You know, it's practically on the American border, it's so far south. And um, uh, they don't want that, 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 it's, it's that economic thing to, to disappear from them because it's, it's, uh, it's all sorts of things, but we need that in our north because that is our community. And that also brings us with Russia. And when we traveled enormously in the north, uh, that's, that's what we did in our own north. We went to 38 communities over six years and some of them twice um, in order to try and get you know, interest up. They have the interest, it's just the will is not there to do that. That's really a frontier for us mm -hmm. that we have not been. And you recognize it because you've traveled so much in the Scandinavian countries and you see that that's a block of interest that Canada has, we developed a northern policy, we have a terrific northern policy, our foreign affairs department developed that 20 years ago, and that's what we were trying to show uh, really existed. And if you do that, you, can, you, you get another kind of grouping than you would if you're talking about north-south to the states or uh, from us to Europe and then you'd get a different kind of trade going as well. Um, you touched on diplomacy, and I just wanted to pick up on, on that, because obviously we're out and we meet lots of um, ambassadors and charge of affairs and, and first secretaries, etc. cetera. Um, do you feel that we're in the middle of a bit of a diplomatic crisis? Um, and, and I say this you know, at a, at a time, um, you know, we, we've seen uh, at least former governments demobilizing, um, embassies, uh, we can have the laptop diplomat, it's okay just to show up at a Marriott and do diplomacy, flip up, you know, your, your I, you know, I mean, you have your iPad and these are the, the five points, I show them to you, do we sort of agree? But we're talking about identity and, and, and I think also, we're also talking about hospitality. Um, and, and do we need to, as countries, whether it is Switzerland, whether it's Germany, whether it's South Africa, do we still need to be out uh, in the world, oh, I think flying that. the flag, yeah. um, inviting people to a residence, because a lot of people say, well, you know, you can just take uh, people to you know, a highway rest stop um, as long as you're nice to them and you can sort of show them the values on screen. Um, and there seems to be some odd forces at work in diplomacy today. Well, I think that we're, we're turning a corner on that. This is a nice Canadian discussion we're having about very, and I think what we have is a very strong foreign affairs department. That is really what we're very proud of. So we have a wonderful, and we have great trade commissioners who our trade is developing. And all of that is, is you know, is I think a most important push for our identity and for uh, the need to go out there and say, we are Canada and we're very different and we have this and that, uh, these sets of values. I think that, um, I think that you're seeing a turning point now and that I think we will continue to, and that there will be a sensitivity, uh, there will be a, a sensitivity to it. Canada has done so many things uh, that people are not that well aware of. In the Korean, uh, the Korean War, for instance, we had 26,000 troops there. Uh, <clears throat> we had a, number, a huge number of losses. Uh, of, uh, and it was not even you know, a war in, in the sense of what the Second World War was. Um, and so in gratitude, the, Kore the South Koreans gave us a wonderful site for our ambassadorial residence together with the British and, and the Americans on a crest of a hill. And not a big house, just you know, a residential house. And, um, and that sort of thing would be precious and, and should not have been sold, right? should not have been sold for money. That sort of thing is, is a, a thing we, we really need to understand that we are in a, in a world so that we don't just look at our own little bailiwick from time to time and say, no, we won't do that. We're in a larger world where we uh, want to influence, where we want to show what we're good at. And we've always been quite good at it. Um, John and I were at a friend's place once in France and they were cleaning out the attic after the father had died 
And he had been, <coughs> they said, you'll enjoy this because he had been in Hong Kong in the 30s. And there were old copies of the South China Morning Post in his attic. And in the South China Morning Post of 1933, there were ads for Canadian products. One was for something called Chateau Processed Cheese, which came from Wrightville, Quebec. One was for Canadian raticide uh, that kills rats, and it's the raticide that Canadians use, um, and Nielsen's chocolate bars. And that was in the 30s. We've always seen ourselves as a trading nation, and that's the one kind of thing that is part of our identity. And those things that you that those things are things that you want to bring, you know, you, to bring forward in a world like today's. As you said, all of these national uh, things that we can put together that aren't just raw, raw, or you know, look at me, but are really genuine. You you point out things that the Japanese do. You point out things the Filipinos do, and all of that is very, very valuable. And to get to the heart of what their meaning is to people, it isn't just spectacle. It is an expression of a certain part of a national character. Indeed. Are we going to ask for questions yes, from the floor? Yes, we should I was have wondering. Yeah. We've rattled on as yeah, we have. good Canadians do. Um, are there... Uh, I think there's, mi there's microphones on either side, but... Thank you. My name is Killian Bloom, and I'm uh, with Swiss Re. Um, I have a question about the national characteristics that you talked about, because to me, this idea to, to uh, match values to territories is, is kind of absurd. And you called the US a theme park, and I agree, but to some degree, every country is a theme park coming up with a different narrative. I mean, most Canadians today, I assume, have not traveled, uh, traveled up the river because there were no roads to explore the wilderness. So why would these kind of narratives still matter? Well, I think you're wrong about Canadians. Canadians have a very special relationship to the kind of nature that we have. And I always like to say to Europeans, Canadians have nature, Europeans have countryside. Uh, on, a, on a la nature au Canada, on a la campagne uh, en Europe. And it's really, we, from the, from the time we're very little, we are used to going into what you would call the wilderness, with all the mosquitoes, the rocks, uh, the danger, etc. We send children to camps when they're six, and seven years old for a month at a time where they're sent off you know, uh, with, with a counselor uh, who takes them on a week-long canoe trip where they set up their own life, etc. because the relationship with nature is extreme, ex very, very vital in Canada. So is somebody who doesn't share that value not Canadian? No, you have your choice of not doing it because there are all the people who are very allergic to mosquitoes or don't want to swim or because they had a bad experience. <laughs> but, but, um, but it is one of the, the things that really makes Canadians what they are. And he mentioned the rocks. And rocks are really important to Canadians. <laughs> and to Swiss. You know, everybody has that different kind of thing, but I think the identity of, of what we are and the relationship mm. to nature and to the hugeness of our land is something that was impressed to, in us when we were children, so that no matter where we came from, I came from this tiny crowded island of Hong Kong, it's much more crowded now than when I left it, uh, and it, 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 my mother, everybody said, you know, my mother was this elegant Chinese lady who just looked, was perfect in every possible way looking at. She learned to fly fish and to cast. She loved the fact that we had a cottage where there wasn't anybody because she had never really liked the pressure of having 200 relatives. And um, uh, that, you know, Canada can give you unexpected gifts. Takes things, some things you leave when you migrate, immigrate to a new country, and some things you gain. And in Canada we gain we gain enormous kind of perspective towards the world and towards the environment because of that. That's true. I think if there's a hand over here, um, if there's, or, or there's a hand here maybe, but um, this woman at the uh, orange top in the second, second row. Well, thank you very much for an interesting session. My name is Yukari and I'm from Japan. My um, question is that uh, what Canada is doing for um, the people whose um, 
thrown to Canada, I mean, especially for refugees, because in my country, we do not accept that much refugees due to the homogeneous culture and then um, huge uh, high language barriers. And I volunteered before um, to help refugees who's coming to Japan to adopt into our society. And what I found out that, of course, there's a lot of things that Japan or government or um, civil society has to do for them, but at the same time, um, it's very difficult for them for, to encourage refugees to have an incentive to adopt into the society. So um, after refugees coming to Canada, I think it's really hard for them I mean, they're coming th all through the difficult processes and um, I have a feeling that they might have a, they, they're not, they're, they have a feeling that, you know, less reluctant to adopt or why I have to do more than, uh, more than this because I flew into all the, the difficult processes or I think that's what general refugees might think. So if um, people in Canada or the government are doing something for them, I would like to hear more about it. I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the government, but I think that obviously, as we've been saying, um, and arigatou gozaimasu, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think it's, uh, Japan is a, is a very a very particular case um, and, and very, very different from Canada. Um, uh, Adrian and I were talking about Japan in particular just beforehand, because I think there is a, probably the, probably the last of the, you know, of the G7 nations, um, which is confronted with a very, I think a very serious topic right now because one side, why do people go to Japan? Because it, it is homogenous and it's unique. Um, now, of course, the downside of everyone criticizes Japan, of course, because it is enormously wealthy and does not do its share for taking, uh, taking people in. Um, but you come back and it's got, of course, more world heritage sites and, and, and all of these wonderful things that we like about it. So it's, it's very difficult. I think people jump on Japan's case a little bit too much. You have to give Japan a little bit of time but also, is it attractive? Is it attractive for potentially, let's say, a young, you know, a Syrian family to go to Japan? They're going to be in a Japan, Japanese context. They're not going to go to Japan and suddenly uh, be thrust into an English language school um, to maybe be completely globalized. Uh, so I also think we have to figure out, you know, where within an international context is Japan taking people in from? Um, is it within the neighborhood? Um, and, and looking obviously uh, within a Pacific region as opposed to saying, should they be taking lots of people from the Middle East? Um, and I think that's, I think sometimes the country gets it a bit, a bit too hard. Um, knowing it's, and of course, a lot flows out of Japan though, um, as well. I mean, Japan also, you know, does its fair share in terms of writing checks, et cetera. Um, but of course it has to improve, particularly from a longevity point of view, as we talked about. Uh, Japan needs more nurses, uh, it needs more doctors, um, it is faced with a real crisis uh, in terms of what it's going to do for aging society. It's a very, a very particular and very uh, interesting society, which I happen to be very attracted to. And, um, but I, I think that it's that specialness that, that makes it, it makes it very, very different and very difficult to say, you know, they should be taking, I think they, they've taken Koreans, um, you know, it, it's, it's in, in the context of that, it, I think it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and the society which has that kind of depth and richness and that kind of um, uh, feeling. I just know from, China, from Japanese Canadian friends, of whom I have several, that um, there are differences of, of feeling when, when you've been brought, if you're a Japanese person and you've been brought up in, in the West and you go back to Japan, there's basically a feeling that you don't really, even if you speak the language, you're not really like them anymore, et cetera. Mm. So these are, these are things that are particular to different, to different countries. Whereas China, I know this from my own experience, that you know, it doesn't matter if you don't speak Chinese, it doesn't matter if you've lived outside in the diaspora for three generations, if you've got, as one said, this person happened to have been a very interesting member of the Communist Party that we met in 1979, and he said to me, if you have one drop of Chinese blood, you're Chinese to us. And that, you know, there's, there's all these differences that, and even, you know, that even in an area that you think, oh, well, it's the, it's the Orient, it's the Far East, there'll be very different points of view. Anyone else? Okay. Any other questions? Oh, ah, just one, someone's you. pointing 
There's a question somewhere back there. Uh, hi, uh, thank you both for the discussion. Um, my name is Matthew, I'm from the United States, so it's great to hear about Canada. Um, actually, um, so my father moved from, <laughs> uh, even for this topic, my father moved from Africa to Canada to do a PhD in the 70s, and it was a rather seamless transition, which I don't think it would have been in the United States, but my question really is, so the U.S. and Canada have almost the same origin story, but rather different histories when it comes to immigrants and minorities. And I was wondering like, what your thoughts on where in American history we went wrong and what we can do to change to be more like Canada. I don't think you have the same orange, uh, origin story. I think I was trying to get at that um, in that uh, Sir Walter Raleigh you know, went went off to uh, the States and, and discovered that you could eat potatoes and grow tobacco and things because that was the kind of climate it was. And it was a temp there was a temperate climate. And then, and then um, it's just a, a geographically and environmentally completely different. And that made it possible for people to bring, uh, who settled, to bring English, British ideals to the United States. And and then what happened in the 18th century was a civil war among English people in North America. Uh, Canada benefited only in the sense that not only did the people who didn't agree with the independence movement come to Canada, but they also, we got a lot of dissenting people. We got people who were of German origin and people who were, uh, who were different, who didn't except that who came to Canada, and they're called United Empire Loyalists. My husband is a descendant of them. And, um, and they came and were given land and, and special treatment by the British in, in what was then British North America, not Canada yet. So I think the origins are so different and the, the problems are so different. And I will just, I think the, the enormous, really what I'd call the original sin of slavery, uh, is the one that really is so difficult for the Amer for the American the Americans as a country to deal with, and they're still dealing with it. There are ramifications from that, uh, where you took a whole group of people and enslaved them, and basically said they were not human. And to come back from that in as short a time as 200 years has been extremely difficult, and that that has made uh, that has made. Uh, a, a blot and a, uh, a stain that, that is very difficult for, for the American nation to deal with. For all the great things that they have accomplished, I was making jokes about their, their entertainment industry, but where would we be without it? And we loved it, uh, we love it. Uh, but it is a creation, and, um, and it's creation that is a dream that's set, set against a certain kind of reality.